Ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. You're listening to the Deal Room Podcast. Join us as we bring you the inside scoop on business sales and acquisitions. Get across trends in the area and hear the industry's best recount their real life tips, traps, and experiences. Now, here's your host, Joanna Oki. Hi, it's Joanna Oki here, and welcome back to the Deal Room Podcast. Today, we are talking with John Hemming from Unity Management, a company which focuses on advising companies on business growth strategies and improving exit value. John comes from the perspective of having worked with fast growth, high tech, online, medical, manufacturing, engineering and service enterprises. And in today's episode, we look at the many angles that may be particularly interesting to businesses that are looking to sell brokers who have dealt with business owners that might have unrealistic sale expectations and accountants who deal with businesses that might be gearing up for a sale in the future or who are looking at ways to be more proactive with their clients. Hi, John. Welcome along to The Deal Room. We're really excited to um, have you along today. Thanks, Joanna. Thanks for having me. Great. Well, I wanted to talk to you today because I know you're a business growth specialist who's also a broker. I thought it would be really interesting to get your insight from a bit of a different perspective on this area of business sale and the disappointment that you often see for business owners when they come to this point of sale. Yeah, well, look, business owners often come to us when they um, have either not got the valuation of the business that they wanted or they've tried to grow it unsuccessfully to build the business that they want basically and yeah it's a yeah it's often a situation where they um they've spent many years trying to do it and then they're mm. you know they're very upset uh, that um it's really going to be able to give them the retirement funding that they want. Right. Okay. And and why is that? Why is, and and I think you're probably talking here about mm. an issue that many brokers probably have to deal with as well, this issue of business owners coming in and thinking that their business has a value that's much greater than is a realistically achievable value, you know, once you're out there looking for a buyer. But what's your feeling for why it is that business owners expect that they'll receive so much um, more than they're likely to actually receive? It really comes down to three or four key things, and that is that they haven't been able to run the business with um, you know, sustainability of historical earnings and profits often. They haven't got the depth of management and the transferability of the management systems and know-how within the business. And, and then also, the, it's very, very hard to predict the, uh, the future earnings and the scalability of the business. So. Mm. Mm, they're, the, they're the key thing. Mm. And just so that we know the sorts of businesses that you're talking about, mm. what sort of businesses do you mostly deal with and what sort of size, you know, do you see the, the greatest risk or issues, you know, in terms of clients that come across your mm. your books? Look, the um, the type of businesses that we deal with, are, they're in the 2 to 20 mil revenue turnover mm. space, mm. and um, but they're from all different industries. But uh, we've been lucky to work with a lot of high growth technology and engineering um, and advanced manufacturing type businesses, but um, but invariably they they all have different challenges of different life cycles, and therefore you know to work with somebody that has got proven you know methods for dealing with these issues is, is, a, is a real benefit to them. Mm, okay, all right. So you get these businesses at the point essentially where they've decided that they wanted to sell and they've mm. what been trying to sell for a while through brokers or other people. Is that right? And and for whatever reason, it's not happening. Is that sort of an example of the type of business that comes to you? Yes, that's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. They've either tried to sell and they haven't got the valuation that they want or they've had it on the market and it's just really falling short or they've tried to grow and knowing, you know, this is the sort of performance characteristics that they need in the business and, and just haven't been able to do it. Yeah, okay. And what's an example there of someone that's been trying to grow and then can't do it, you know, in terms of what are they doing wrong? What often, what characterises a business that's trying to grow and can't grow? Mm. So there's a lot of businesses at the moment where, and globally we're seeing a lot of limits to growth around finding the right people and internal HR capability Mm. and capturing IP within the business. Mm. So there's a lot of businesses out there that they they really do reach their potential and then without actually putting the right people and business systems in there, 
it's very difficult for them to to scale up and transfer that knowledge and and also capture that knowledge from a succession and you know even employee share scheme through where the directors can exit the business mm. and um, or it could be just at a technical or operational level you know where they they just haven't got that knowledge transfer within the business and and you know can prove not only a limit to growth but quite an operational risk as well. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Because obviously, a, a buyer that's coming into a business wants effectively, at, you know, at some stage, generally, to be able to take over the business entirely themselves. Even if they don't, you know, usually owners are selling because they want out. <laughs> you know, they mm. want to leave. Mm. But none of this is possible if there's not an easy transfer of the whole business to someone else. I guess that's sort of one of the underlying issues, isn't it, for these business owners? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So transferability of um of the business. And the repeatability of future earnings and then good documentation of databases and business systems, it all goes into capturing business value and increasing that valuation when they when they do want to exit. Mm, okay. All right. Great. And so what are the recommendations that you give to these businesses? Are there, are there usual recommendations at the point when businesses come to you that you give to them or is it you know something that's tailored? Yes. The, the, all the programs are tailored. We have a process, a proven process of that we take the business owners on. But in the first instance, we we look at the business model. We validate the business model for today and in the future so that they're really wrapping the business around a model that is going to deliver, you know, the the customer service and the revenue and the profit and therefore the valuation of the business at the same time. Mm. That's a really important part of, of of the first step because then they can see that path around, okay, well, we're at $5 million, but we want to turn it into a $7 million business. Okay, this is the model we need to take. These are the projects that we're, and activities that we need to do. And, and this is, you know, how we're, you know, we're going to really be able to re- reverse engineer the business at, at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Is that, you know, the first step for most businesses that come to you, whether or not they're closer to that two or that 20 million? Mm. Because I guess two to 20 million is, you know, a big difference in number. And, and presumably sure. you see, and certainly I see from my perspective, the mm. way a $2 million and a $2 million business and a $20 million business is run are often quite different, right? And so I guess when you have these businesses coming to you at the 2 million mark versus mm. the 20 million mark, what's the biggest difference in the reasons why they're finding it different to sell, difficult to sell? Or is it the same reason? That's a really good question. I mean, often they're very, very, very similar reasons. But it, often, it, look, I think if I had to say two, two things, it really comes down to often business culture and the performance culture that's actually embedded in the business with the people, but also the systems and processes that they have to then, you know, run the business with the people. And I think that's really really key because that then enables the business to scale and but it also is key to capturing the um the asset and as we all know you know income follows assets and Mm. and um and that all is very very easy for somebody that then does due diligence on the business to um to see okay everything's here that i need to move forward and i can see that i can scale I can see that you know the um the future earnings are going to be sustainable and um and they're very comfortable with it. Mm. And so you talk about performance culture. So what's the example or the type of thing that characterises mm. an optimum performance culture in an organisation? Let's say an organisation that is mm-hmm. towards that smaller range in that 2 to 10 million. What's, what's an ideal performance culture mm. there? The key performance culture is really around, I think, look, it's, to simplify it, it's really having people within the business that have a can-do attitude. Mm. The businesses, I've been completely stunned at, at businesses that are, are working very hard to do the right thing by the customers, but they're just constantly falling down that ability to, to, to get things done and to remain customer-focused. So it is about having the, you know, the can-do attitude, but remaining customer-focused as well, mm-hmm. but also having great communication. So those those three things are, are really hallmarks of a of great performance culture. And overarching that obviously is the leadership around, okay, well, you know, where are we going and how are we going to get there? Mm. And having everyone come together under that. Mm. 
Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. Interesting. So what have you got some examples for us? I'm, I'm interested to hear about, you know, some of these examples of businesses that have come mm. to you with some war stories about, you know, trying to sell and, you know, having issues and, and then, you know, perhaps how your working with them has put them into the position that then, you know, they've got a new view on how it is that they'll eventually be able to exit on their own terms. A really great example is um, an advanced manufacturing robotics company that was it had a lot of its business, um, I suppose, uh, in the old world economy, and um, they're running things really without too much automation. But they had a very stifling culture, and um, and I, I think they uh, they were really able to connect with their customers. And you know, one of the first things we did was really understand what the customer wanted, and then we built the service delivery and the capability of the business around that. And you know. They had a very senior level of staff as well. You know, they had about 30% of the staff were over the age of 60. Mm, and wow. and also they had a uh, prior business owner was still in it. And mm. it was really when those older staff moved through the move on from the business and were able to embrace some technology, rebrand the business, reposition it, have this dialogue around being customer focused and, and uh, you know, really wrapping the business around what the customers want today really took off. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it sounds like it, it's not necessarily a fast process, though. It's uh, sort of something that obviously takes time. That's right. Look, and I think, um, I mean, that example is, a, you know, I mean, that's a two-year project, mm-hmm. really. Mm-hmm. That's, a, that's a transformation from an older style business into a business set for the 21st century, you know, with full robotics and automation and, and that sort of thing. But, you know, Within 12 months, you can have a very, very different business if the, if the business has changed ready. Mm. And, um, you know, it, uh, yeah, it's a very exciting process. Absolutely. Great. And look, I guess this issue, the whole issue that we're talking about of business owners spending years and years growing this business, finally deciding that they want to sell and then at the end of the day, finding that maybe the business isn't worth what they'd expected it was, is going to become more of an issue as time goes on. Because, you know, we're, I, be, I believe in the next sort of decade going to see a flood of baby boomer businesses being sold. So this will cast business owners at that point into a pot of, you know, a larger pool of businesses on the market and potentially less buyers, right? So the time, the time is right now, if it's going to take a while to shape your business properly for the right exit, you know, now's the right time to start, isn't it? That's exactly right. And look, I think if we had to say one thing about this whole process is, is that, you know, businesses have come to us very late in the day where their father, maybe a father and son team that where he maybe the father may be 65 and the time it takes to turn the business around and have it succession and have it future-proofed is it's really too long and often health issues are involved mm. and given everything that's happening on the global scale as, as on the global um, stage as well, you know, business environments are changing so fast. So, you know, part of this process too is around future-proofing the business mm. and really getting the opportunity to clear the slate and go, okay, this is what the business needs to move towards. And, um, you know, with obviously with succession in mind, but, you know, capturing business value, working out what the people coming through the business want and making it happen. Mm-hmm. Okay, fabulous. And so do you have any I guess, alternative approaches to um, selling a business that you sometimes recommend? Oh, look, I think the, you know, employee share schemes can be very good, as you would know, Mm. Joanna, Mm. you know, setting those up where people are coming through. I mean, they are the best way to ensure that culture of the business is maintained often and somebody takes the business over internally and and it can be done in a very... um, a uh, fair way over a period of time and a very low risk for both parties. Mm. Mm. And, um, you know, everyone knows what's involved. Um, you know, that's probably the, the easy, you know, that's probably one of the easier, easier approaches. Mm. Mm. And so do you have any tips for, I guess, businesses if they're looking to sell in the next, let's say, one to five years? What are the, you know, I guess the top few tips you would give them in terms of the action steps they should be taking now to get their business? into a sale-ready state? Look, the first step is to get a a valuation or an appraisal of the business today around its existing condition. And then you can work out the gap around, okay, well, this is actually what we need out of it or this is what we think it's worth or what we want to build it towards. Mm. And then once you've done that, 
the really the key thing is to validate the business model today and future proof, you know, for, for operating the business today and then to the next, you know, three to five years. Can't really look much further out from that. And then, you know, make sure it's a really customer centric business with the competitive pressures from global markets, the internet, technology that are considered because a lot of the businesses are going to uh, kind of come under pressure from technology that we've never ever seen in the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. Right, and this is this is really one of the key things that we do in the um, in the in the strategic planning phase. We look at that, and it can save you an enormous amount of time, but also make you an enormous amount of um, you know profits as well. You know, being ahead of the curve, you know, and not waiting to be then having to react to something a technology, for example, that comes out of left field that you know you haven't really thought about. Yeah, mm, fabulous. Okay, and what about for brokers? because we have many brokers who listen into this podcast. Do you have any tips for them in how to deal with businesses that come to them when they can see from the outset they're they're dealing with a potential seller who has a real gap between their belief of the value of their business and what the broker really knows is a likely value out in the marketplace? Yeah, look, I think it's probably a situation of um, managing ex- everyone's expectation and um, very strong rules of thumb around selling businesses at fair value. And I think it's it's really around educating the the seller around the different ways to value a business. And I suppose that whole rule of thumb, at the end of the day, it's only worth what somebody's willing to pay for it in a, yeah. in a, in a certain time frame, right? So Absolutely. You can, and really just be, and, and that's where the valuation process around including price sales is so important mm. over and above all the other methods. You know, everyone uses price earnings multiples and all this sort of stuff. Yes. But the price sales valuation, you know, and looking at price sales is, is so important. And yep. um, that's probably a really good process for everyone to just sort of get a bit of a, uh, you know, a bit of a, a reality check on it. A reality check, I like. <laughs> <laughs> if I could know that. Yeah. <laughs> and look, it might be an opportunity as well. You know, we we also have a lot of accountants that are listening into this podcast. And I see this as, you know, an opportunity for accountants to also add a bit of value in terms of their dealing with their clients mm. as well, right? You know, if they can identify clients that they know are looking to sell in the future mm. and recommend to their clients early enough to go and get the right advice to help with the correct strategies to grow the business in shaping them up for a sale, then they're doing the ultimate, they're providing the ultimate service for their end clients, really, aren't they? That's exactly right. And look, I think it's important to, I really like to say, I mean, I work with a lot of terrific accountants, but there's a big difference between accountants and the work and the approach that they take and the work that we do. Yeah. Accountants are very retrospective. They're, they're often looking backwards on the business around financial performance and that sort of thing. And I'm not saying that's not important, it is, but we're very forward looking and you know, it's a much different approach. Yeah. So it's about a team approach, I think. You know, I think yeah. one of the things in being a trusted advisor for a business, whether that's from an accounting or a mm. consulting perspective or a legal perspective, is thinking about your client, you know, and your services to your clients more holistically, you know. And there's so many things that we can do from a legal perspective to really help build the foundations for businesses well before the time for a sale. You've talked about loads of areas that you can work on building with the business well before a sale and accountants have their own area that they can work on. And I guess what we need more of, I believe, is this connection of these different types of professions working on businesses to um, all help them together in each of our different areas to really build them from each of these different perspectives in time enough before they get to that sale point. That's my perspective anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And because um, they really all do hand, go hand in glove, you know, that's exactly right. And um, and when you do find a team of accountants and, and legal legal team and, and consultants and development and they can all work together, it's just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, no, no one's more upset than all of us as the professional advisors who work with our businesses as our clients, businesses as our clients, when they come to the point that they're disappointed about the sale value, you know, and at that point, yes. when they're at the point of sale, there's not a lot that each of us individually or even together can do to push that to push that price. Yeah. It's really the skill of the broker and, and the potential pool of buyers that are out there at that point. But it's just if we're able to come in a little bit earlier, then I think together we can all, you know, really achieve great outcomes for our clients. Yeah. 
No, that's exactly right. And just avoid the disappointment where they then don't have to make a decision that is less than perfect or it's a for, it's a for sale or yeah. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Exactly. And, you know, obviously businesses don't know what's going to come at them in, you know, at any point. Sometimes for sales happen, don't they? And they come out of the blue. So I guess even for businesses that aren't really lining themselves up for the sale in the near future, it's always a good idea to have a business that is well owned and able to be sold just in case you enter that environment where a for sale situation occurs. And hell, you know, some of these perspectives that certainly that I talk about with businesses, it sounds like that you talk about with businesses as well, are really about growing and getting the business in the right shape that makes it a better business to run in any event, right? Whether or not businesses are looking at sale in the future or not. Yeah, that's exactly right. As so well said, I mean, I've done strategic plans for very good businesses that have then implemented everything we talked about. And then we ring them three years later and go, are you thinking of selling? And they go, well, we'd love to, but it's so profitable. We're just kind of cold on for another, love it. another four or five years. That's you know, great. Give us a ring then. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah, no, it's unbelievable. So, yeah, that's the name of the game. And then, you, and then you've got the options, right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's all about options. <laughs> yeah. Great. Okay, wonderful. Well, look, thank you so much for your time today, John. Um, I thought it was really interesting. Hope our listeners were as well. Just as a bit of a recap, we were talking today about dealing with the disappointment of businesses at business exit who suddenly find out that the, their business isn't worth what they had thought um, over all this period of time. And, and you talked about some action points as well, about getting evaluation and understanding the gap, about validating the business model, about making sure a business is customer centric and making sure it's ahead of the technology curve. So so thanks a lot for coming along and we look forward to hearing you all later. Thanks. Well, thanks a lot for listening in to the Deal Room podcast today. If you'd like more information about this topic, head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com. That's the dealroompodcast.com, where you will be able to download a transcript of this podcast episode if you'd like to read it in more detail. You'll also there find details of how to contact John at Unity Management, unitymanagement.com.au. There you'll also find details of how to contact our lawyers at Aspect Legal if you or your clients would like to discuss any legal aspects of a sale or acquisition. We have a number of great services that help businesses both prepare for a sale or acquisition to help them prepare in advance and to get transaction ready, and also to help guide them through the sale and acquisitions process once it's started. We work with clients both big and small and have different types of services depending on size and complexity. So don't hesitate to book an appointment if you want to find out how we might be able to assist. And finally, if you enjoyed what you heard today, please pop over to iTunes and leave us a review. And don't hesitate to also send questions in to us. We love receiving questions from our listeners and love to talk about them on our podcast in the near future. Thanks again for listening in. You've been listening to The Deal Room Podcast with Joanna Oki. See you next time. Ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen. That will conclude this evening's entertainment. Thanks for listening to The Deal Room Podcast. To find out more about this episode and other episodes in the series, check out the show notes or head over to our website at thedealroompodcast.com.au. 